It's always good to see what is happening for our mission um, emphasis. Anyway, um, let me update you a bit on the church budget. Um, as you can see in the bulletin, uh, it's the second part of the bulletin there, down towards the middle. Um, uh, our goal for the, the ending goal year to date is $45,000, and the end of the fiscal year was September 30. So what did we actually receive? So the next line down says end of year received. How much is that? $46,499. So we exceeded the goal. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. I, I think that's, that's, that's wonderful. As a treasurer, I, I thank you. And um, maybe we should have a little praise. Uh, would you like to sing the doxology with me? Shall we do that? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Yes, thank you. Amen. All right. So, thank you for remembering church budget. Now, I thought I would mention a word about offering plates. Um, the church board has talked about passing offering plates, and we're kind of spread out here all over the church. Um, and that's okay. Uh, so the church board agreed that we would just continue to use the offering boxes. And I'm going to get some different offering boxes, and we're going to put them against the wall. So in a few weeks, I hope we'll have uh, a nice-looking place for our offering boxes rather than just on the counter. Uh, it's easier, it seems, for some of our members to use the offering boxes, so we'll just go ahead and continue that. Um, and many of you are giving on uh, Adventist Giving online, and that's just fine as well. Okay, so let's go to today's offering, which is Oregon Conference Youth Support. 80% of that offering goes to our academies, 10% goes to young adult ministries, and 10% 10 for, 10 for Big Lake. Um, about Big Lake, who has been there? Anybody been there? I actually haven't been. Most of you haven't. You, you all have gone, gone there, okay. So did you know that the old lodge is gone and that they built a new lodge? You know that. That's kind of cool. That, that happened last year, so that, that's great. And because of your offerings for Oregon Conference Youth Support, uh, that helped the lodge to be built, so that's great. Amen. Amen. So let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Your blessings are many. Your goodness is great. And we thank you for meeting the budget goal. We thank you for the offerings that we give today, also for children's, for church improvement. And uh, may those offerings do what you need them to do, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. It's your time. And... Uh... Yeah, I would love some company up here. All right. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. You guys look all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. What's that? A fox? Yeah. He's sticking his head out of something. What do you think that might be? Yeah? Some people call that a foxhole. Foxes make their, their homes in tree trunks like that. Or sometimes they make them in the 
just the ground. You'll see a hole in the ground. But um, a fox's home is quite often referred to a foxhole. Let's see if we can get the next slide to go. What's that? That's right. That's where a bird lives, isn't it? Isn't that unusual? So totally different than anything we live in, isn't it? And yet they like it. They work hard at building it, don't they? They don't have electricity or power, TV. They don't have any plumbing, but they, they suffice just fine. They raise their babies in the nest. Let's see here. It's hard to see because the lighting is really bad there, but that happens to be my living room and, or my family room. And um, that's my grandson. Uh, he's right, it's really bad from this perspective. It's a little bit better from there. That's my grandson waving. And one of his favorite things to do when he comes over to our house is um, make a fort in the living room or wherever. And we use the couch as, as a brace on one side and, and stools on the other side. He likes to sit down beforehand and write out a, a blueprint. And he wants to show Grandma how exactly how he wants it done. And we get out uh, some of the best materials is sheets, clothespins. That's what I used when I was growing up. But I'm a little fancier in my house. We get to use string and safety pins as well. And believe me, it's so much easier than safety pins. You know, the sheets, if you just bump them, they'll, they'll come apart. But uh, no, we, 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 he loves, I mean, and here we, are, we already have a beautiful home. And he wants to make his own because he wants to be able to be creative and design it. We used to, my brother and I, that's not a picture of our fort, but we used to build forts like this in trees in the woods. We used to get real creative with some leftover lumber that my dad would give us. And sometimes you'll see um, shelters in the wood like this where people are just trying to use whatever they can to make themselves a little shelter from the cold or the wind or the storm. Those are, those are just what I would call a, a fort out in the woods. There's a lean-to against a tree, and there's a really fancy one people have used with straw and sticks. Um, I thought that was interesting, our, our, our video that we just had had yurts. And I was looking at them, I thought, you know, this sanctuary looks like a really fancy smancy yurt from you know the inside, because it's, it's all round like their yurts were. But it's got a lot more to offer us. But you know, when I was little, my brother and I, and our friends, I should say my, my two brothers and I, and our friends, we were all Seventh-day Adventists. And Seventh-day Adventist kids, they see life from a biblical perspective. Let's just put it that way. And when we played in the woods, we used to play games like, um, we called it the time of trouble. And we used to pretend like we were, we were trying to make it on our own and there was nobody to help us and we had to forge through the woods for you know berries and wild onions and survive and and we would build forts like this and we would we would you know pretend do pretend fires because we knew better than to start a fire in the woods um, but at the end of the day guess where we went we went back to our home that was nice and warm but we were practicing, right? In our minds, we were ready to go, right? Well, you know that the Bible says, uh, if I can get to, okay, whoa, well, whoa, well, too far. Oh, I ruined the surprise. Okay, anyways. Jesus says unto them, the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, he grew up in a home he came from a heavenly home. We don't really know what it looks like, but this is somebody decided to try to draw what he thought it might look a little like. But I have not seen nor ear heard of the wonders that God has in store for us. But Jesus left that home. He was king, and he left that home, and he left his throne, and he came down here to this earth so that he could live in the woods just to save us so that we could go live with him in heaven someday. Isn't that wonderful? So I just want you to know, no matter where you live, some people live in the woods. 
Other people live in mansions. Other people live in trailers. People make a home wherever they're at. But wherever we live on this earth, we have an incredible home to look forward to with Jesus. So you may go back to your seat now. I'm sorry, I have the fans on and I'm drinking water. It's just, it's just me, hold on. Dottie, are you going to be okay? Need a blanket? <laughs> um, let's bow our heads with a, for a word of prayer. Dearest Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. Thank you for the promise of eternity with you in paradise. Please, Lord, come and speak through me today. Um, give us forks and knives so that we can digest what I have to say. I pray in what you have to say. Amen. Oh, about this time last year, I had a dream. I was in, I was going through the Orlando airport, and I just, I just got off the plane, and I was, I was going through the airport, and somebody ran and grabbed my purse and took off with it. And oh, the devastation. My cell phone's in my purse my wallet, my credit cards, everything that I needed was in my purse in order to get where I was going and do what I wanted to do. My, my keys to my house were in my purse. My driver's license, so they had the address to my house was in my purse. All these things were going through my head. And the next thing I knew, in my dream, I'm, I'm in this warehouse, this huge warehouse that was abandoned, and I'm sitting next to this bomb fire that all of these homeless people had made, and they're all living in this warehouse, and, and I'm looking around, and, and they were some of the most vilest criminals I'd ever seen. They were the most vulgar people, and, and just, it was just devastating, and I sat there, and I thought to myself, all hope is lost. I, I have nothing. Everything is gone. What am I going to do? How am I going to survive? And I thought, okay, well, I'm here with these guys now. I might as well be like them. I might as well turn to a life of crime. There's no other way to get along. Oh, it was just terrible. But then all of a sudden, I had this, this, this light came on, and I'm like, wait a minute. I have a husband. I have a husband at home in Washington State. Oh, I forgot. Thank God. He, all I have to do is call him, and he'll send me a plane ticket, and I can go home. Home. I love my home. Oh, my home is luxurious and comfortable. It has a split king adjustable bed with a Tempur-Pedic mattress. I have a hot tub. I have beautiful grandchildren that live next door to me and a loving husband. I love my home. And it was such a strong emotion that it woke me up. And there I was in my split king adjustable bed with new sheets and a Tempur-Pedic mattress and a warm, loving husband next to me. And I was so excited. I wanted to wake him up and say, honey, I'm home, I'm home. But the poor guy already thinks I'm crazy enough, so I let him go. But I just, oh, my pillow was so soft and everything just seemed so comfortable. And I just sat there, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you. There is no place like home. There is no place like home. It, always, it hasn't always been that way for me, but that's my reality now. And I praise God for that. Ultimately, for all of us, though, Jesus is our heavenly protector. He is the church's husband. He is our greatest luxury, and the Holy Spirit is our greatest comforter. Heaven is our home no matter where our journey takes us in this world. Whether we live in a home now or end up living in the woods, it's just temporary. We don't need to turn to a life of crime and sin to survive. 
We are all born helpless victims in a crime-infested world, but because we have a Savior, we are survivors. So is it always good to have a home? I guess it depends on where you live. My husband grew up in New York City. He tells how there are city blocks that go forever, full of low-income tenements. In these buildings, so much theft and other heinous crimes occur constantly. Anything that can be stripped and sold for money is. Lighting fixtures, plumbing, toilets, you name it. Many of these buildings quickly become nothing but bare shells after they have just been built. They don't make for very pleasant homes. Jack once lived in a beautiful high-rise apartment complex in New York City with a well-dressed doorman and private parking. The lobby was well decorated with furniture and a colored TV. He had to go through an extensive background check in order to qualify to live there. But a popular mayor decided to do a social experiment. His hypothesis was that poor people were poor because they just hadn't been exposed to the nice things in life. Perhaps if they were just given nice things, then they would be willing to take care of these nice things and live more civilly. So they decided to set aside some apartments in Jack's beautiful building for government-subsidized low-income housing. Very shortly, things went south for that community. Crime went up dramatically. The doorman quit. The nice furniture and colored TV were stolen from the lobby. The security gate guarding the parking garage was stolen. His car was vandalized. Gas would be siphoned from his gas tank. He developed a keen desire to escape his hometown. The life he had always known became unbearable for him, so he set off for the West Coast. I'm actually glad he did, because if that hadn't have happened, I wouldn't have met him. It breaks my heart to travel through the large cities in our country now. With each passing year, Tent cities are growing larger and larger, and trash heaps around them are getting bigger. Crime and vice of the most horrific nature are reported by absolutely stunned law enforcement and city officials. It's hard to imagine people living like that. I have often thought that I would love to do anything I could to eradicate the problem, but what? I have seen through many experiences of my own that just giving homeless persons shelter does not necessarily solve their homeless mentality. My heart aches for answers. I read articles and I listen to experts who are str also struggling for answers. I don't claim to have all the answers, but I do believe in the barley loaves and fishes approach. I do believe that if we strive to do anything to glorify God, that he will expand our influence and resources to do more. It boils down to this one principle, that we need to do, we need to not just do something for the sake of doing something, but we need to do something with purposeful thought and out of love and care for their ultimate welfare, not just their temporal needs. There are many reasons for homelessness, there are people who lose their homes due to financial crisis, domestic violence, and natural catastrophes. The authorities tell us that the greatest reason for the homeless crisis we see cropping up in the cities is from mental disease or mental illness. These mental conditions, more often than not, are caused more so out of substance abuse than ever they were before. Back in the 1800s, they would incarcerate the severely mentally ill with criminals. This only aggravated the situation. The 20th century, during the 20th century, they decided to, to build mental institutions. During World War II, many conscientious objectors who chose not to bear arms were sent to work in these mental institutions. After the war, many of them brought to the world's attention the abuses, neglect, and terrible living conditions in which these patients were in these facilities went through. The experts then decided that mental illness was caused by a socioeconomic crisis. So they addressed mental illness from the perspective of, of allowing them to live freely, but to aid them with welfare programs. Talk doctors became very popular during this time. Unfortunately, 
A lot of these talk doctors also administered a lot of drugs. So of course, the pharmaceutical companies had to get on the bandwagon. I was watching a commercial the other day, and they were advertising a drug that treated the side effects of another drug for depression. I just shook my head. The unfortunate consequences of taking the mentally ill out of these mental institutions without having a proven way to deal with them left many of them with no lasting answers. Today, it is believed that mentally, uh, mental illness like schizophrenia and bipolarism um, are actually biological. I tend to agree with them to a certain degree. The bare facts are that our world has a crisis of mental illness because we have 6,000 years of degradation from sin affecting our genes and our attitudes. I believe we are all mentally ill. Some of us just have a higher functioning mental illness than others do. Ellen White described the antediluvian world as people that were far more superior in longevity and strength. They had an intellectual and mental capacity far superior to any of today's greatest minds and athletes. Creationists believe that mankind has been declining, but evolutionists believe that mankind is progressing to be a more superior being to our ancestors. And yet I look at our cities. A fallen world separated from our maker is the cause of mental illness. If this fact is ignored, there is no real hope in solving our homelessness. I'm going to submit to you today that this whole world is suffering from the varying degree of mental illness whether we live in mansions or live in woods, whether we dwell on the bottom or on the top. We can have either a homeless mentality or a homeowner's mentality. You can take some homeless people and put them in a house, but they can still have a homeless mentality. You can destroy the house of someone who with a homeowner's mentality and they will still have a homeowner's mentality even if they find themselves in the woods for a while. If one has a homeowner's mind, they can make a home for themselves no matter where they end up. My husband and I have often joked for years that we would be okay if we had to live in the woods because he grew up a Boy Scout and I grew up a Pathfinder and together we could make a home wherever we ended up. I don't judge anyone for being homeless. And because tomorrow is not promised to us, there is a chance any one of us could be homeless tomorrow in the physical sense. But I also don't believe that anything will happen to us unless God allows it for a reason. And I know that whatever happens here on earth is only temporary. A homeowner mentality gives you the ability to sing from a jail cell when in prison for your faith because you know your mansion waits you awaits you in heaven. The pilgrims were not afraid of privation and hard work. Ellen White said that for years no one went without, yet no one saw a pauper or a beggar in their communities. They came here with hardly anything to their name. They were, there were no hotels or RVs. Everything they lived in and every resource they had, they worked for. They had lived in other countries and made it there as well, only to have what they made for themselves taken away from them. Alan White wrote, at the opening of the 17th century, the monarch who had just ascended the throne in, of England declared his determination to make the Puritans conform or harry them out of the land or else worse. Hunted, persecuted, and imprisoned, they could discern in the future no promise of better days, and many yielded to the conviction that for such as would serve God according to the dictates of their conscience, England was ceasing to forever be a habitable place. Some at last determined to seek refuge in Holland. Difficulties, losses, and imprisonments were encountered. Their purposes were thwarted, and they were betrayed into the hands of their enemies. But steadfast perseverance finally conquered, and they found shelter on the friendly shores of the Dutch Republic. In their flight, they had left their houses, their goods, and their means of livelihood. 
They were strangers in a strange land, among a people of different language and customs. They were forced to resort to new and untried occupations to earn their bread. Middle-aged men who had spent their lives tilling the soil had now to learn mechanical trades, but they cheerfully accepted the situation and lost no time in idleness or repining. Though often pinched with poverty, they thanked God for the blessings which were still granted them and found their joy in unmolested spiritual communion. They knew they were pilgrims and looked not much on those things, but lifted up their eyes to heaven, their dearest country, and it quieted their spirit. In the midst of exile <clears throat> hardship and hardship, their love and faith waxed strong. They trusted the Lord's promises, and he did not fail them in time of need. Angels were by their side to encourage and support them, and when God's hand seemed pointing them across the sea to a land where they might found for themselves a state and leave to their children the precious heritage of religious liberty, they went forward without shrinking in the path of providence. The pilgrims were forced to take a stand for religious liberty, to live free from the oppression and tyranny of a king or pope. They risked their lives for a vision so that they could live free in what was forbidding and barren wilderness. In other words, they chose to live in the woods. But just like anyone else with a true heavenly owner, homeowner mentality, they made a home for themselves wherever they went. They weren't afraid of hard work or privation in order to freely live as their God-guided consciences dictated. <clears throat> they lived without a king or pope who were the very ones who proposed themselves to be their protectors. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and all of their descendants were once homeless. They sojourned in a foreign land, never building stone or stick homes, because they were not to take possession of the land until God told them to do so. When their descendants finally took possession of the promised land, they built stone and stick homes. But because of their apostasy, even these more permanent structures were destroyed. No matter how well built a structure is on this earth, if it, it can never withstand God's judgments. Just look what happened in New York City 20 years ago. What is a home other than a sanctuary in which we live in with our closest loved ones? The wilderness sanctuary in the Old Testament was a house of God that was a shadow or symbol after the heavenly plan of salvation. This salvation brings us home to live with our God if he is our closest loved one. The church's heavenly husband can always be called upon to save us from a homeless mentality. If we have the faith of Jesus and keep the commandments of God, we are heirs to the sanctuary promise. We are homeward bound. We are never homeless. God's remnant church has been given the sanctuary message to spread to the world. We have a spiritual home or sanctuary right here on this earth. It is where we dwell through faith spiritually with our Savior right now through his gospel plan of salvation. It is our great commission to solve spiritual homelessness by helping people find the sanctuary truths for what they mean. Ap apostasy against the truths of this heavenly sanctuary destroys not only homes, but more importantly, it destroys families and churches. Cain killed his brother Abel, his own flesh and blood, Joseph's own brothers sold him as a slave. Israel stoned their prophets and killed the Son of God. The reformers, or as I like to remember them as the sanctuary cleaners, were beheaded, imprisoned, and, burned, and burned at the stake. In the 1300s, John Wycliffe found a group called the Low Lords. Wycliffe translated the Bible into the language of the people. Low lords were considered a cult by the mainstream. In our time, they would have been labeled conspiracy theorists. You had to be bold enough to stand for truth, even at the cost of being precluded from participating in the economy and even losing your life. 
Low lords restored the truce portrayed at the table of showbread. They claimed, or they cleaned off the covers that the Catholic ecclesiastics had obscured it with so it could be viewed in its original meaning. They cleansed and restored the principle of our responsibility to study God's word for ourselves. Don't let the world or even the church spoon feed you their version of truth. Remember, God said that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded from the mouth of the Lord. In the 1400s, Martin Luther founded the group called the Lutherans. Luther protested the act of buying forgiveness. In essence, he restored the altar of sacrifice by bringing attention to the sanctuary truth that Christ's sacrifice is sufficient for the forgiveness of sins. If you were a Lutheran back then, you would have been considered a cultist or a conspiracy theorist. In those days, the term was heretic. The Lutherans lived on the fringes of society. They were hunted and persecuted by the church, who were their own brothers. Ellen White actually describes Martin Luther as growing up in an abusive home. Luther abused himself a lot by trying to earn salvation. He displayed obsessive compulsive behavior. The world of psychology today would describe him as mentally ill. But God had a purpose in his life and he chose Luther because of the character he had developed through his experiences. Inspiration foretells leaders whom God chooses to ordain to his work <clears throat> will often be persecuted. Can you imagine if the internet would have been around back then? Well, I heard that Martin Luther kills babies. Everyone is saying it. The mainstream accused them of being hateful and not caring about others when the actual opposite was true. In the 1500s, John Calvin founded the Presbyterian movement. Calvin had a burden for prayer. He restored the sanctuary truth of the altar of incense. We don't have to go to the priest to confess our sins. We can go directly to, the, to God in prayer. If you were a Presbyterian in those days, you would have been treated like a cultist or conspiracy theorist. But guess who would have been persecuting you? The Lutherans. The Lutherans thought that they had discovered all the truth that there was to have. The internet would have gone wild. Well, I heard the Presbyterians are killing babies. Everyone's saying it. In the 1600s, John Smith and Roger Williams founded the Baptist movement. They believed in baptism by submersion. They restored the truce behind the symbolism of the labor in the sanctuary. People would have said about you if you were Baptist, you're crazy, you're a cult, you're a conspiracy theorist. Don't you know that everyone sprinkles? And the internet would have gone wild. Well, I hear that Baptists are killing babies. Guess who persecuted the Baptists? The Lutherans and the Presbyterians became friends because they had a common enemy. People said, you Baptists are just focused on baptism. But that was a present truth for that time. People didn't understand and accused them of just focusing on one thing. No, God had called them into existence for a reason, to expose and restore the present day truth of his house his sanctuary. In the 1700s, John Wesley founded the Methodist movement. Wesley taught that everyone is a light to the world. Everyone. Every believer. He restored the seven-branched candlestick. If you were a Methodist in the 1700s, you would have been considered a conspiracy theorist or a cultist or living on the fringe of society. Guess who would have persecuted you? the Lutherans, the Baptists, and the Presbyterians. Are we starting to see a pattern? The town criers would have said, I heard the Methodists kill babies, stay away from them, don't listen to them, censor them. They are a danger to themselves and to others. 
You should read the history of some of the things that were said about the Methodist church when they came on the scene. This is how the devil attacks. The simplest way to attack truth is to simply say, they kill babies, or they're mentally ill. By, this, by these methods, they attempt to negate the remnant's influence. In the 1800s, there was another article of furniture in God's house left to be restored, the Ark of the Covenant. Can you, can you see, can you just travel through with your eyes? This is why I don't have a PowerPoint presentation. I want you to just look at it in your mind's eye. The 2300-day prophecy that the sanctuary would be cleansed or restored ended in what year? 1844. We are not Adventists by accident. It was God's design to uncover through his providence the truth of his moral law. God's law is his, is his description of true love. It was a love letter. Mankind has a warped translation as to what constitutes love. If this world had its way, we would think that to love means to kill babies. And they are doing just that. And if one gets through that system of so-called family planning, the world turns them into deviants. This church's mission is not only to restore the law, but to the entire understanding of the sanctuary truths, especially the most holy place. We are the last day church. This is it. We are commissioned to uncover all the hidden parts of God's house and clean off the cobwebs so his house can be occupied by its true owner once again. In the most holy place, there were more items of truth besides God's moral law. We have five things I'm thinking of here. We have the Mosaic law or civil law was stored where? A lot of people knew it as the law of Moses. I, I think of it as the civil law that he gave to run their society. But they were told to store it on the side of the Ark of the Covenant. Not the inside, but the side. Inside the Ark, there were two items. Anybody know? Aaron's rod and the bowl of manna. The covering cherubs sat above the ark. There was one more thing above the covering cherubs. What was above the Shekinah, or, or, or excuse me, I just gave it away. <laughs> what was above the cherubs? Cherubims. Shekinah glory. If history tells us anything, there will be a fringe movement that will be attacked for uncovering these truths. The Ten Commandments weren't the only law given to Moses on Sinai. They were also given other laws um, to direct the civil life of the Jewish society in which Ellen White said, our governments today would be wise to consult. They are otherwise known as the civil laws. A book of these civil laws sat on the side of the Ark of the Covenant. White also said that not only would God's moral law be widely disregarded in the end times, but man's civil laws would be widely disregarded as well. Huh. We have seen civil unrest evade our country. The media tries and executes without trial and encourages mob rule. The people disregard our system of justice, which was widely fashioned after that of the Jewish system. Burning, looting, and convictions without trial seem to be acceptable even amongst those who used to advocate for civility. The few who are brave enough to raise concerns publicly are humiliated, humiliated canceled, and even at times physically attacked. They are called racist by those who are racist, and the actual, literal baby killers are calling those who strive to protect civil society the baby killers. Then, there's Aaron's rod. Aaron's rod was God's way of teaching Israel that he will be the one to choose whom he pleases to work through. He has told us that the weak will confound the wise, and those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. 
You see, there were those in Israel who wouldn't accept it when God changed their traditional way of choosing the firstborn as leader. You remember Korah? God is dictated by tra- God is not dictated by tradition. He chooses self-abnegating leaders who understand that they must decrease so that he can increase. He chooses he works his disciples were uneducated. He uses the uneducated to confound the academics. <clears throat> he doesn't choose the arrogant or the proud. Those who think of themselves as more superior than others will be humbled. In the last few years, the truth of Aaron's rod was uncovered, and those who uncovered it were persecuted mercilessly, even by those who helped to restore the truths of the moral law. The bowl of manna is God's way of teaching Israel that God will be one, the one to choose what sustains his people. What kind of diet will they have? And what will they put into their bodies? Daniel understood this principle well and protested the king's provisions. Those who have uncovered these truths are being persecuted mercilessly. There was a rally the other day in Hawkinson in support of the teachers who had been fired because they conscientiously objected to injecting the king's provisions into their sovereign bodies, just as Daniel had. These people are being persecuted as conspiracy theorists. There were people driving by literally yelling at them, literally, you are killing the children. In other words, killing babies. Where have we heard that before? We must not ignore the cherubim watching over the ark. We must restore this precious truth, but first we must understand how. We are told that the angels will minister to those who have not heard God's truth so that everyone will be prepared to stand in God's Shekinah glory, but there will be imposture angels. We must recognize the angels of light by their message. We have clearly been warned that the devil himself can appear as an angel of light. The devil will pose as Christ returning for the second time and will speak against the very law in which the cherubim are commissioned to watch over so carefully. He will imitate God's very Shekinah glory. The demons will imposture our dead loved ones and persuade the world to wonder after the beast and the false prophet. Beloved, don't believe every spirit, but test them. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. We are told that those who strive to expose these impostures will be considered hostiles to society and accused of the most heinous crimes. Let me guess, probably baby killers. Through the Protestant Reformation, somehow that got left out, but eventually the death penalty will actually be, be passed. Through the Protestant Reformation, God restored his house. It is now time for us to get our house in order because the end of our planet Earth we call home is one labor pain push away from its end. The climate crisis won't be stopped by mankind. We must prepare the people for the last thing in the sanctuary to be uncovered and revealed. The last thing left after the cherubim, or should I say, above the cherubim, Last but not least, in fact, the most important feature of the sanctuary is God's Shekinah glory. We must prepare the people to stand in his unveiled presence when he comes. Jesus himself will come in all his unveiled glory. He will be restored to his people and exposed to the world for who he is, the perfect righteous son of God. We do this by exposing his law and his will now. We must make known his plan of salvation in its fullest light, holding nothing back. And we will be persecuted. Okay, here it comes. They will call for a worldwide death penalty. At last, on those who boldly approach God's throne of grace in the face of all opposition by man and demons. I love my home in the country. 
I prayed for it for 10 years, and God finally opened up a way for us to move. Inspiration counsels us to get out of the cities and raise our families where we will not have to, too much interference from our neighbors, and we can grow food and enjoy the fresh air and all of nature in its fullest, far away from the crime and the vice of the cities. Just like the early reformers who lived in the wilderness in order to get away from the interference of their liberties to worship and live as their consciences dictated, free from arrogant, tyr tyrannical rulers. We are admonished not to be presumptuous or get ahead of God, but we must be willing to lose our home and even our lives and maybe even our church rather than compromise the truth. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Luke 17, 33. Are we ready to meet in the woods? We have a job to do no matter our earthly employment. We will never be out of our God-given job, so therefore we will always be truly employed. We have a job to keep the sanctuary clean. We are cleaners, janitors, however you want to look at it. If our Lord and Savior conquered the grave, he can certainly conquer our unemployment. We have a heavenly mansion that belongs to us, so we can't truly ever be homeless. We may have to camp out here for a while, though. We may even be asked to live without our loved ones for a short time. But keep in mind that those who sleep in the grave are safe safeguarded from the tempter. The devil has no power to even bother them ever again. They will never feel the pain and suffering of living in a fallen world ever again. The current worldly narrative on how to survive and save our planet we call home is rallying a one-world cooperation in vengeance and censorship of truth. The world, is calling for sin this, the world is calling sinfulness good, and they call goodness sinful. They are calling hate love and love hate. I guarantee you from, this, from henceforth, you will hear messages that will call for the dragon's definition of love. What they really are calling for is compromise with the wicked for the sake of false peace. They will call for the lovers of lamb-like liberties, haters, and call draconian dragon talkers, lovers. The devil will fool even the elect if it were so. The churches are gaining confidence as they celebrate progressiveness towards compromise. They nurture rebellion and the spoon-fed can't see this. The world is eating from a spoon. Time is short. It's time to pick up forks and knives. Just like the instigators of the French Revolution, they call for a brotherhood of confusion, a fragmented fraternity, and a unity with arrogance. But they ostracize God's truly faithful. This world has become an exclusive club for ho those who do not search the scriptures daily, studying line upon line and precept upon precept. Those who speak to the law and to the testimony are considered to be the fringes of society. Remembering that the law describes God's character of love, the world has a warped idea of love and what love is. The testimony of Jesus helps us to decipher who to worship the lamb-like lamb creator or the fallen dragon-like creation. In seeking to help the homeless, we should ever keep in mind that God's form of charity and love is not just a strong, sentimental feeling. God's love and charity thinks about the eternal welfare of a person. It requires purposeful thought. It doesn't overlook sin, but faces the sin problem head on. If sin could be overlooked, then Jesus would never have had to die on the cross in order to redeem us from it. In seeking to help the homeless, we must ever keep in mind true unconditional agape love, which instructs us to seek their eternal welfare, which is often in conflict with their desires. The world's warped form of social justice won't rid eternity of oppression or homelessness, and the unity of fallen mankind won't provide us with an eternal family. Caleb and Joshua lived on the fringe of society because they went against the mainstream narrative. They would have been considered conspiracy theorists in their time. The children of Israel didn't believe that God could give them a home in a land that seemed so unconquerable, so they suffered homelessness for 40 years. But even in the desert, 
Hello, thank you. But even in the desert, he gave them a sanctuary and their bread was sure. They learned the hard way that with God, all things are possible. He is able to set a table before us in the midst of the wilderness and in the presence of our enemies, even when all seems hopeless. The flawed science of man won't take us home. Even by the rockets designed by Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, or others, they can't get us high enough so that we are safe from the judgments due this earth. Those who put their hope in the Tower of Babel learned this lesson the hard way. Mankind's science wasn't what raised Jesus from the grave. And the science of the Illuminati and Jesuit designed United Nations won't protect us from the grave. There are souls desperate for a word of hope and love. If the law of God is love, then the greatest underlying reason for homeless, the homeless crisis is one of lawlessness. It is a moral issue, not a socioeconomic one. 6,000 years of lawlessness is now coming to fruition in the lives of spiritually depleted souls. We have a mandate from our life giver and sustainer to stand up and call sin by its right name. Even though to do so according to the world is hate speech. The dragon deflects his own characters onto the faithful of God. Sometimes the things that need to be said can only be said in ways that offend. Let's choose our battles today, but let's choose to battle. So what is a homeless mentality? Having a homeless mentality means you have lost all hope because you have lost faith in God. All things work out for those who love and obey the Lord. With God, all things are possible. David said, I was young and now I am old, yet I have never seen a right the righteous forsaken and their children begging for bread. In the scriptures, a beggar is used to symbolize an unrighteous person, one who is manifesting unrighteousness, a reflection of their godless spirit, outwardly manifested in begging. But God will only do things in his perfect timing. Having a homeowner mentality means that you keep on doing what is right even when everything seems to be going wrong. When you don't give up the battle and you don't give up on love. Having a homeowner mentality means that you know that whatever you are going through, even if it means living in the woods, that you actually own a heavenly mansion now. You will live as a survivor, not a victim. In order to help victim mentalities, give them a vision of hope by telling them the truth of what lies ahead. And because everyone is a free moral agent, it is their freedom to accept it or reject it. For the Lord God is sun and shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. The early reformers were homeless and churchless. They lived in forbidden wilderness places. They worshiped under the forest for cover. They had no PA system, fancy pulpit, or padded pews. They had no heat system or compressors. They had no landscaping to keep up or lighting to update. They were not afraid of hard work and privation. I, above all people, appreciate luxuries and comforts, but Jesus Christ is our greatest luxury and greatest comfort. Jacob found himself homeless. As he was made his way through the wilderness, he used the rock of salvation as his pillow. The Son of God had nowhere to lay his head on this earth, but upon his heavenly Father. Home is where the heart is. Jesus said that the church is in the heart. We will never be without a church as long as we have Jesus in our heart. We will never be without a home as long as Jesus is our Lord and Savior. Martin Luther fought for the, to keep his home together. He stuck around until there were no other options. He tried communicating every way he knew how. Luther understood the principle that the definition of insanity is to do the same thing over and over again expecting different results. So he did something different. Sometimes the only way to change a bad situation is for strong people to stand up and do something different. He wasn't afraid of losing all earthly support. He nailed his now famous 95 thesis on the door, uh, the church door on October 31st, 1517. 
Martin Luther's 95 Thesis on Righteousness by Faith was a list of grievances against the church, but it was also a declaration of independence. It was a statement of liberty only through faith in our lamb-like rescuer and protector, Jesus Christ. To the leaders, it appeared more like he was filing for a divorce from the church. From outside appearances, many divorces look to though both parties are at fault. But is this what we believe of the Reformation? Do we as Protestants believe that if there is division in the church, it must mean both parties are at fault? The ecumenical movement is proposing this. People have forgotten what the protest was all about and long for a unity, um, and they long for unity just for the sake of peace, not because they seek unity and truth. It was agreed upon last board meeting that next Sabbath, October 30th, I should post a list of these 95 theses on our church doors to help our members recognize the significance of that day. Actually, it's October 30th, October 31st will be the next day. Morris Vinden actually wrote a book about these, but he made a more updated list of 95 theses of righteousness by faith, which I believe are more appropriate for our time. So be looking for these on the the window. We're gonna we're gonna try not to destroy the church by posting them, but I'll, I'll figure out something. <clears throat> October 31st used to be celebrated by Protestants as no, that was the Catholics. Who, what did the Protestants? The Protestants started recognizing October 31st before the Catholic Catholics turned it in to All Saints Day. Thank you. But the Catholic, the Catholic ecclesiastics saw to it that it would be forgotten. They implemented a different holiday called All Saints Day. Today, the world celebrates spiritualism on Halloween. They dress their children up as demons and load them up with a substance they quickly learn to abuse. As Adventists, we believe, you may not read this in some of our articles lately, but as Adventists, we believe that the United States of America is in biblical prophecy. Ellen White describes the United States as an exceptional country for a specific and profound reason. Horns in prophecy are symbolic for strength. This country is exceptional in strength only through what Ellen White referred to as our grand old document or our constitution. The lamb-like horns spoken of in Revelation are the United States constitutionally protected religious and civil liberties. She said this, I didn't. We are supposed to have a constitutional republic, which means the people we put in office do not rule us. Our constitution rules our leaders as to how they are to protect us. So our leaders are not to lord it over us as the pagans of old did. The, di the biblical church structure is very similar. Our civil liberties are to guarantee us protection from the tyrannical rule or ruler of a king, and our religious liberties are to protect us from the tyrannical rule of a pope-like figure controlling our churches and our individual moral sovereignty. For this reason, I have been proud to call this country and this church my home. By anyone who but anyone who proposes to violate this grand old document's principles of civil and religious freedom is a dragon talker. The dragon would rule these protections by destroying our sovereignty and thus the Constitution, our sovereignty protects. We have seen an opposing dragon speak from the beginning of the foundation of this country, but this dragon speak is unconstitutional. It wars against the principles of our Constitution Wars have been fought between lamb-like principles and dragon talkers from the beginning of this world. But Jesus said, the time of the end would come on as a birth pains of a woman. When a woman is in labor, you know she is just about ready to give birth when you see the baby crown. Ironically, corona, as in coronavirus, means crown in Greek. I'm just saying, no, this virus is not the mark of the beast. 
But the draconian reaction from this world to this virus is the very express character of the dragon. That's where you get the word draconian, because it's dragon speak. As, a civil and religious, as our civil and religious liberties are quickly being usurped, so comes the crowning of the dragon. Once you see the baby dragon fully crowning, it probably has just one more push away before our country gives birth to this full-term dragon. It's just a matter of a very short time before this full-term dragon destroys our country, recall home, by crushing our liberties with its tree-sized tail. He will seek to wear out the saints of the Most High, but we can look up and know that our home draweth nigh. True religious liberty has only been afforded a very few throughout the history of our world for a short period of time. But before the United States existed, there were still Christians. They did not experience the freedoms that we have today, but they recognized and longed for these freedoms because lawfully protected liberty is the express character of Jesus Christ. He never compels or forces his will upon mankind. The whole reason why the civil and religious liberties of our Constitution were called lamb-like was because they portray Christ's character. The very character of the dragon is to force someone against their will to obey someone else's ideas and values, even if only by peer pressure, but more so more, but, but more so by more heinous ways. We are told that every means of worldly support will eventually be taken away from those who cling to the Lamb, and all we will have to hang on is our faith in God. Jesus Christ himself had only faith to hang on when he hung on the cross. To all human perspective, he could not see how his father would ever want him to come home. But he, hang on, he hung on his father's words and his promises. We are told that faith is all we will have to hang on to, too. Ellen White said, the agencies of evil are combining their forces and consolidating. They are strengthening for the last great crisis. Great changes are soon to take place in our world, and the final movements will be rapid ones. Yet those who place themselves under God's control to be led and guided by him will catch the steady tread of the events ordained to, for him to take place. The spoon-fed will not catch these trends. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. Do you believe in God? Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. Human language is inadequate to describe the reward of the righteous. It will be known only to those who behold it. No finite mind can comprehend the glory of the paradise of God. Do you still have a homeless mentality? Do you feel hopelessly stuck in a destructive place or lifestyle in which there is no way out? Brothers and sisters, if we seek first the home of God, if we don't turn to a life of crime and sin, if we call out to our heavenly husband to rescue us, we will never be homeless. Through our great rescuer, protector, and provider, we are survivors. We are redeemed. God has already solved true homelessness. Let's pray. Dearest Lord and Savior, please come and guide your children home into your sanctuary today. We want to dwell with you forever. Amen. again.